I, I, I don't I don't feel like making a who you're gonna call joke. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. It's on streaming now, so I have finally gotten around to seeing it. Uh it's more or less what I was afraid it was gonna be based off the trailers. Now, uh, if you didn't see my trailer reactions at the time, basically I spotted a handful of what looked like nifty ideas. Um, interesting ways to progress things, new things to bring into it, and then a whole ton of stuff that just looked like it was references for the sake of references. And that's, that's basically what this is. It's a very mixed bag, and it got off... Uh, <laughs> Like, I feel like the first two scenes kind of exemplify what is both good and bad about this. Because this thing begins with a cold open, <laughs> cold open, um, set way in the past where some people like in the turn of the uh, the 20th century, uh, you know, early 1900s, they, you know, ended up summoning this thing that just froze them all to death. And like, you, you see these firefighters come across this scene and it's, it's, it's nicely atmospheric and it's eerie and you're not entirely sure what the heck happened, but it's well presented in a way that's like, yeah, that that seems intimidating. And then we jump to the present with our primary characters from uh, the previous one being um, uh, a family of three, the mother, the two kids, and also Paul Rudd. Uh, so you've got the four of them in Ecto-1 chasing down a ghost and they're just bickering. And that was when I knew we were in trouble because the, I, I've started to, I, I kind of think of this as like the, the Shrek problem because there's a lot of things wrong with most of the sequels to Shrek, but one of the big recurring ones, and this became super evident by the third one, is that because they know Shrek is grumpy and people liked Shrek being grumpy in the first one, they have to contrive a reason for him to be grumpy in every freaking damn movie, even though every single one ends with him being in a what should be a happier situation. But we have to start the next one and he's grumpy as hell again. It's a similar thing here. There was a reason that these characters were on each other's nerves and bickering in the previous movie because, you know, for the mother, her fa her estranged father had just died. She's dragged her kids to this place where none of them have any roots of any kind. There's a reason for them to be bickering and a, and a little bit tense. Here, they just are for no reason. Well, no, I know the reason because they were last time and you can't, you can't have relationships evolve in a movie franchise. They have to remain the same. <sighs> So those two scenes back to back kind of exemplify this movie for me. There is good stuff in here, but boy, it feels like every other scene they just they just do something that just makes me roll my eyes and get a headache from how hard I rolled them. So, all right, what is good here? Well, um, I like the villain. I like Garaka. Um, he is, he's just a nice, intimidating figure. The use of the ice, I think, is is pretty well done. And he just, he looks good. I love the intensity of the glowing eyes they've got on him. That's solid. Like, I just, I like him as a threat. And I feel like he's built up pretty well. Um, Ghostbusters as a franchise has a, kind of has an issue with the overriding villains. The first movie gets away with a lot because it has to just introduce the premise and it doesn't really introduce the idea of Gozer until it weighs into it. Then you had the second one, which had Vigo, who gets introduced early and then sits in a painting and does freaking nothing. And this, like, it, we know he's trapped, but like from very early on, just the sense of the power of this thing is well communicated. And so him getting out while inevitable also feels like it carries some weight. So I, I like Garaka as a villain. Uh, some of the performances are, like, none of the performances are outright bad. But some of them are notable. Uh, mostly from the people who seem to be the most excited to be here, which does not seem to be the main four. Like, and none of them seem miserable, but they all seem like, yeah, this this was this was next on the list of things to do. Let's uh, let's do this. But then you've got people like Pat Oswald, who basically only has two scenes and who is clearly so happy to be here. And also, actually, Dan Aykroyd seems to be having a lot of fun in this as well. That was nice to see. Um, Camille Nanjani can go either way on me. I actually found I I, I rather liked him. 
I kind of I kind of liked the progression of his character. I feel like they balanced his just awkwardness that he tends to bring to a lot of parts just right where it didn't tip over into annoying because it can for me sometimes, but it didn't here. So that works pretty well. Um, they actually found an interesting thing to do with Winston, which is nice. It also like kind of makes sense. Winston was always the most put together and stable member of the team. So it makes total sense to me that he's the one who's the most financially successful. He's able to fund like this further research, like the idea of taking research further than just trapping these things and trying to learn more about them and study them and all this other stuff. Like this has been a natural development from the very first movie that the franchise just hasn't done. So it's about dang time. But you know, all this stuff doesn't, it, it, it has to share space with stuff like Walter Peck is the mayor. Really? Really? And you're going to set up and fail to do the most obvious and the one callback I would have liked you to do. So, <sighs> one of my favorite moments in the original Ghostbusters, yes, I'm off on a nitpick tangent, just go with me. One of my favorite moments in the original Ghostbusters is, is after the containment unit has exploded and Walter Peck is blaming the Ghostbusters when it's his fault for demanding the thing be shut down in the first place and... He he starts yelling at them, and Egon, who is, you know, the calmest of the lot, you know, later in the movie, he, you know, he says to Ray, I'm terrified, I'm terrified beyond the capacity for rational thought, and just says that in a deadpan. But Egon, of all people, gets so pissed at Peck, he launches himself at this guy and goes, Your mother! And it's great! It's like the one time Egon snaps, and it's so good. And they freaking set it up with Walter Peck with Egon's granddaughter who is more or less the primary character in this as she was last time and like he gets in her face is like so are you going are you going to you know chill or are you going to be a problem for me and then they cut to like her you know with handcuffs on and whatever I'm like how could you not have her launch herself at him and go your mother it was right there it's the one callback I would have actually liked. No, instead we got to put Slimer in here for no goddamn reason and give him a butt. There's, I, I don't know why this bugged me so much, but there was one shot of Slimer like going through a wall. You see him from behind. He has a very distinctly sculpted ass. Why? Why is that there? Well, why is he in here at all? First of all, basically just to give Finn Wolfhart something to do because he's got freaking nothing going on. They bring back two other supporting characters from the previous movie, one of which took me a second to recognize, and the other, if they hadn't blatantly said who she was, I would not have remembered her at all. And I liked Ghostbusters Afterlife. But, you know, there's podcast who I did like in the previous one, but feels like a tag-along very much here. But then there's Lucky, who was the sort of love interest of Finn Wolfhard's character. And she showed up and he's like, oh, you're here. And I'm like, who? Wait. Okay. From context, I, I got like, I'm supposed to remember her. And then I was like, oh, right. Okay. Why are you here? And, ah, just all this stuff and the absolutely pointless callback to the library ghost. And it's, there's all this irritating stuff and then there's stuff that like could have worked but is undercooked so like there's this ghost melody that the that the daughter who I can't, phoebe ha <laughs> there we go that phoebe starts to connect with and it's not a bad um it's not it's not a bad trajectory it's not a bad character it's not a bad payoff at the end however in a franchise with this is now the fifth theatrical release, and this is uh, the fourth one in this continuity specifically, you're having a ghost that just does not behave the way ghosts have ever behaved in this. Because she behaves in sort of a more stereotypical non-Ghostbusters ghost way, which is that she looks more or less like a translucent person. She seems perfectly coherent. She acts like a person. And I'm not saying you can't do that, but if you're going to do that in a franchise that's gone this long where the ghosts that are explicitly supposed to be dead, because, like, I know some of the stuff is just demons, like Gozer and the terror dogs and whatnot, but, like, other ghosts that, like, 
That was clearly meant to be a person at some point, but they're weird and misshapen and lumpy and they act so not human. Why do you act like this? I'm not saying there's no answer you can give to that, but you kind of should. <laughs> Just because that's the immediate question I was asking. And I figured that was going to be part of the twist would be revealing why it is she's she is so much pulled together. And they they just don't. Like, there is a twist involved with her, an incredibly obvious twist, especially if you've seen the the uh, reboot of DuckTales. It's a painfully obvious twist. But I, w I thought the twist was somehow going to tie into the fact that she's, she's just so different from every other ghost. And like, no, no, we're just not going to deal with that. Okay. Whatever, man. Oh, one last weird side tangent. <coughs> I... There's no nice way to say this. Bill Murray looks horrible. And the thing is, I don't just mean it in an aging bad, badly way, because Dan Aykroyd looks his age and doesn't look great. I mean, not everybody can be Ernie Hudson. Holy crap, that man looks incredible. He's in his 70s. He looks amazing. <coughs> but anyway, like, I understand not everyone's going to age like that. And Bill Murray has always been an odd-looking guy. He's probably going to age into an odd-looking guy. But... He looks bad <laughs> in a very specific way because he looks like he hasn't been to the makeup trailer. And I have no evidence of what I'm about to say. I'm just saying what it looks like. What it looks like is he shows up on set not early enough to be touched up by hair and makeup and just goes directly to the shooting set and as a result looks weird and pockmarked and unkempt in a way that is completely inconsistent with everyone else having having been touched up by the makeup department. It's just, it's it's weird. It's just weird. He's not he's not awful in this. Actually, like here's the thing about Bill Murray. He has such a unique energy to him that even Bill Murray phoning it in is usually still not a detriment, at least to me. Um, I'm still like, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. And they have Janine for no real... Like, I like seeing Janine in the in the jumpsuit. That's nice to see. But, like, she didn't have a reason to be here. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that just doesn't have a reason to be here. And the good stuff is, is here. Like, the idea of expanding out to studying these things more. And, and this really interesting new villain that's quite intimidating. And, this, and there is stuff that just has to share space with all this other stuff that I just, I don't care. <laughs> I just don't. I mean, this is the epitome of, of a mixed bag. When you talk about a mediocre middling movie, generally you're talking about one of two things. Either the whole thing is just kind of meh, or you have good stuff offset by bad stuff. This is that. This is the latter. So, I think I'd still rather rewatch this than Ghostbusters 2. Might be a minority opinion. Um, but, uh, anyways, Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. What did you think of it? Whatever your thoughts are, drop them down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills. Enables me to do this as my living. Even if you can't help me out that way, like, share, subscribe. All that stuff helps. Don't worry too much about it, though. We take a relaxed attitude around here, so you can just come on back next time you need a break. And now to thank my highest supporting patrons. Robin Moore, Zubin Mutfula, Goddess Elida, Welsh Wrestling Geeks, Oliver B, Melissa Pedersen, Tarak, The Thing That Goes Doink in the Anime, Gene Foray, Movie Turtle, Ulrich Bogdan, Loki Eris, Melinda Walters, Auntie Kate, 808, Becky Sparks, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Dave Hall, White Bearish, Rosalind Bennett, Pal Barabajagal, Mira G, and Sir Didymus is my favorite. Oh look, you actually get a face this time and not just butts.